Robin Radar Systems provide you with a complete overview of bird and drone activity on and around your aerodrome. Our bird radars provide you with the actionable information you need to take control of your bird hazard issue. With both tactical and strategic data on offer, you'll be able to mitigate and prevent high-risk bird activity more accurately and with less effort than before. Increase safety while reducing bird strike incidents and expensive claims. Our drone detection systems enable you to take early control of drone hazards as they develop. Coordinate drone incidents with confidence and share clear and accurate threat location information with law enforcement agencies and other stakeholders. Reduce costly disruption and delays while increasing safety and security. Subscription-based pricing options available. Get in touch with us to find out more. Rising air traffic volumes over the last decades puts increasing demands on reliable aeronautical information availability, which is often inaccurate, outdated, inconsistent, faulty or hard to read, and so undermining the safety of civil aviation. NG Aviation supports the industry by the digitization of various aeronautical information significantly increasing safety, improving data quality, and enhancing situational awareness. Its digital platform transforms previously scattered aeronautical information into a single comprehensive data source shared among all aviation stakeholders. NG Aviation gives all involved parties the possibility to speak the common language. Our platform significantly improves communication, information and data exchange. So, for example, if a taxiway must be closed, all involved parties are notified via digital interface. Digital communication allows for clear, more effective and safer airport operations. Digital data improves communication and navigation through complex airspaces. In case of closure due to military exercise or unexpected circumstances, stakeholders are notified in order to avoid any hazardous situation. The unexpected closure of a runway during the approach is not a problem anymore. Our platform shares the information immediately in a clear and visually understandable way. NG Aviation builds safer and more effective digital aviation of the future. Join the revolution now. powerful solution to the FOD problem, AFOD, is an electro-optical detection system supported with artificial intelligence, which is built to prevent the damage to airplanes and airports caused by foreign objects. Thoroughly inspecting airport runways, AFOD provides a constant flow of images and information to a central unit located at the control tower to be further processed by advanced AFOD algorithms. AFOD serves four main functions. 
By continuously inspecting airport runways, it detects FOD specifying their location, size, number, and type of material. It also identifies wildlife presence, providing information as detailed as the species of the animal detected. It detects cracks and accumulation areas. It measures the depth of snow and thickness of ice. At Moog, we understand how costly foreign object debris can be, which is why we offer the Tarsier Automatic Runway FOD Detection System. In the 11 years since Tarsier was created, it has helped ensure 6 million plus FOD free operations. It's the United States military's system of choice for FOD detection, and it can function in any and all weather conditions. The difference between Tarsier and manual FOD inspections is easy to see. Tarsier has proven that it detects all the FOD all the time, while manual inspections may miss items due to lighting conditions or the speed of a vehicle inspection. For over 65 years, Moog has been servicing the aircraft industry with innovative products and solutions. With the Tarsier Runway FOD detection system, we're providing a solution that can generate revenue for your airport, prevent costly airport damage and lawsuits, and improve safety. Contact us. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this session on asset inspection and management uh, from the Aviation Events Group. We've got three speakers for you this afternoon uh, Gabriel Navarez, Robert Fitzjohn, and Johan Lindvall. Uh, I'll introduce the three of them uh, shortly. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing the various comments and questions that you may have, and we'll try and respond. So please use the um, facility uh, in the QA and we'll have a session at the end of each speaker's talk. So uh, please do uh, think of questions as you go along. Delegates can also communicate uh, using the front row networking tool in the bottom right-hand corner uh, of your screen. So firstly, we'll be hearing from uh, Gabriel. Gabriel Navarez is the Deputy Aviation Director in the Facilities and Service Division of the City of Phoenix Aviation Department at Sky Harbor International Airport where he's been for more than 16 years. He started in fleet maintenance and has been holding progressively responsible leadership positions before becoming the deputy in 2020. So Gabriel, over to you, Asset Management from Phoenix. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ian. <clears throat> so yes, today we will be uh, talking a little bit about uh, uh, how we are building an asset management team. Uh, so with that, let me start with the, uh, my presentation. Uh, so uh, in this slide, you can see a, a few factoids about Sky Harbor. Sky Harbor has uh, two uh, uh, terminals, uh, Terminal 4 and Terminal 3. 80% uh, of our traffic uh, travels through Terminal 4. We have three runways. Uh, the Facilities and Services Division supports the airport by ensuring that the buildings, equipment, and the grounds of the airport system are maintained, safe, clean, and welcoming. Uh, the Facilities and Services Division is similar to a public works department, uh, within a municipality. Uh, and in many ways, Sky Harbor is like a small city in terms of the size, budget, uh, structure, and staff size. Uh, we have about 450 employees and facilities and services is about $120 million budget. Uh, so throughout this meeting, I'm gonna go over uh, who, what, when, where, and why we are creating an asset management team. 
So let's start with uh, why is an asset management uh, uh, team uh, important? And there are several reasons why. Uh, in, in this picture, uh, th this is the Burton Bar Library. Obviously, we don't have a library here at the airport, but this is part of our C uh, city of Phoenix. It's, it's our main library for the city of Phoenix. It was designed by a prominent local artist uh, on Saturday, July 15, 2017. The Burton uh, Bar Library uh, was significantly damaged due to a, a monsoon storm. Uh, a monsoon storm is just a fancy way uh, of saying a wind and rain uh, in the middle of summer. So high winds, a lot of rain. Uh, now, it wasn't the windstorm that caused the damage. It, it just started a chain of events that led a catastrophic situation. The windstorm uh, shook the library's roof, releasing dust. The smoke detection system confused the dust for smoke. Uh, the fire sprinkler system then filled with water. And although the sprinkler heads did not activate, the water gushed out of the holes in the pipes that was caused by corrosion. Water caused the damage in all five floors, uh, causing it to close for repairs for about a year. $10 million uh, uh, worth of damage. So after some forensic investigation, it was discovered that the system was disabled because of the corroded pipes. Uh, where uh, essentially they were causing the uh, air compressors uh, to burn up because they were continuously running. Uh, the library maintenance manager made the decision to postpone these repairs due to a perceived lack of funding. Uh, at the very end, this resulted in a new policy and a, and a new asset management division for uh, public works. So uh, taking a, a, a small note from that, uh, this is where we lead into our asset management team. So how do we currently manage assets here at the airport? Uh, our section managers are responsible for maintenance and repair of the various systems while maximizing the availability uh, and minimizing the downtime uh, and capital asset replacements. As a section manager, one must wear multiple hats. However, sometimes there is a danger of wearing too many hats. The risk uh, could range from conflict of interest, diluted effectiveness. Sometimes tasks that require immediate attention are prioritized, while others uh, requiring significant concentration are placed in the do later pile. Uh, juggling multiple roles uh, is not a long term solution. It's only a matter of time before one of those uh, hits the ground, and uh, you can bet that it's going to be the one that was placed in the do later pile. So an effective asset management program consists of multiple elements, asset inventory, computerized uh, maintenance management system, uh, uh, facility condition assessments, uh, capital planning, and asset uh, life cycle management. It, it is essential to know, uh, uh, speaking of inventory, it's essential to know how many assets you have uh, and where they are. An accurate inventory should include basic details, year make and model, the date of install, expected life cycle. And we'll talk about a little bit about uh, expected life cycle uh, later on in this presentation. Uh, some of our sections do a great job of identifying their inventory assets and others do not. Why? Because we, we, we do not have a standardized way of doing this. Uh, as you develop an inventory, it's important to categorize them in a systematic structure. Uh, the ASTM E1557, uh, it's a standardized classification for building maintenance elements. It provides a common structure in linking the building uh, uh, assets. Now, we have multiple computerized management systems uh, where we manage all of our assets. Uh, yeah, to manage our assets where we inventory a lot of them, we, we track the repair and the, and, and the PMs. Some of our computerized maintenance management systems are managed internally and some are managed through a contracted vendor providing the service to the airport. Uh, SAP is our primary work order set and asset management system. Uh, Micropaver, for example, is our airfield pavement condition assessment uh, database. Uh, what we do not have is a way of bringing all of these, this data together to help with our asset capital replacement. So a facility condition assessment, uh, it, it's a visual survey physical, of physical assets that identifies uh, deferred maintenance deficiencies and, and capital renewal needs, uh, followed by an actionable and, and prioritized plan with cost estimates. Uh, we accomplish this through the use of consultants. Ideally, it's best to have the facility condition uh, assessment data uploaded into a CMMS system. 
And capital asset planning, uh, this next part for me is, is, is the fun part. This is where you can take all of the data that you've gathered and start to crunch some of the numbers and ultimately create a projected replacement plan. Uh, life cycle is based on manufacturer's recommendation, industry standards, obviously the environment in which it, it is used, and preventative maintenance history. Let's uh, look into what that looks like for, uh, for an escalator, for example, real quick. So here's a, a typical diagram of, a, of an escalator. Um, as you can see, uh, there, there's multiple build grades. Uh, whether it's a commercial, a, a public transit, and, and a transit, transit being the most robust grade. Uh, the, the age is, is uh, uh, certainly a, a considering factor. Uh, suggested life for uh, these escalators is 25 years, actuals uh, for some of ours are 30. So usable hours, again, suggested, taking this into account, uh, 150,000 hours actual for this one escalator in particular is 225,000. Uh, environment, uh, do we have heavy loads? Well, you know, we're at an airport, we're 24 seven, and we constantly have heavy loads. Uh, and then ultimately, this is one of the items that, that really sneaks up on you. And, and this is determined by the various manufacturers. It's obsolescence. For example, uh, we, we received a letter from our manufacturer saying that a bull gear is, is no longer being produced. Uh, what's a bull gear? This is the bull gear right here. Uh, essentially, this is the heart of, of the system that drives everything on that escalator. If, if I can't buy a replacement part, uh, th then it's no longer usable to me. Uh, and then obviously uh, having a good O&M contract, uh, it, it, maintaining these will certainly escalate the cost of uh, that O&M contract if you don't replace them uh, within the usable life. So how many folks, this, this is uh, obviously a rhetorical question. If I was live, I'd be asking the question, how many folks on this call have some type of construction going on? Uh, if you're an airport like ours, we're continuously having construction projects, or as uh, I'll refer to the, the, the shiny new thing. The, these are uh, recently completed. Uh, as you can see here, this is part of our SkyTrain, two brand new stations, 24th Street and Rental Car Center. Uh, here's another example uh, of the interiors uh, of, of that system. And uh, here you further see uh, the uh, uh, Sky, uh, this is SkyTrain and uh, S1. We're adding a brand new concourse to our Terminal 4, which is going to complete our eighth and final concourse. So we reviewed, uh, up to this point, we, we've reviewed several reasons why asset management is important, what, what are the essential elements of the program, and uh, when you should plan uh, asset replacement. Now, now let's talk about who. Uh, should execute the plan and, and how it all comes together. So uh, pretty typical organizational chart. Here's a copy of ours. Uh, and essentially, we manage all of our different sections by discipline. And what I mean by that is, is uh, I've got four superintendents and they manage their teams. Uh, in, this, in this one example here where I'm highlighting them, I'm highlighting the two electrical section heads. One section head uh, focuses on the building electrical, the other section head focuses on the uh, airfield electrical and so on. So we have a mechanical maintenance section head, we have a fleet maintenance section head, building maintenance and so on. So our plan is to develop, as you can see on the far right, uh, to develop an asset management section where the areas of responsibility coincide with the basic elements of asset management. This is what our proposed org chart looks like. Uh, there are a lot of uh, overlap in responsibilities. For example, uh, the facilities uh, supervisor uh, coordinates the facility condition assessment uh, with the consultant. Uh, the database supervisor, all the way in the far right, uh, takes that data and uploads it into the CMMS. And then in, right here in the center, uh, the, 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 oh, sorry, let me back up. Uh, the admin supervisor uh, conducts the evaluation, builds a business case to acquire the capital funding, and then we execute the project. Uh, the overall facilities uh, asset manager oversees the program, prioritizes the major maintenance needs, drives the capital projects and delivery, 
and, and creates and maintains the asset uh, life cycle forecast. So what are the next steps uh, for us uh, here recently as uh, most uh, organizations, they have a, a supplemental process at the end of the year. Uh, you try and justify your case as to adding uh, additional folks to your team. We've been successful in getting some positions approved. Uh, our facility asset manager, our uh, facility supervisor, and our project planners uh, have been approved. So our first steps beginning July 1st, uh, we're hoping to fill those positions. And then comes the fun part is, is developing the asset management road, uh, roadmap. And that's going to start with uh, developing the policy, uh, the strategy, and, and uh, ultimately implementing uh, our next steps. Um, and uh, so with that, that's, uh, that's my presentation. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Gabriel. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, very interesting. A um, couple of couple of questions, if I may. So, particularly from the airport perspective, you know, the is the the access requirements on an airport to to get to your assets to to inspect and 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 maintain. We'd all imagine that's perhaps more complex on an airport, but I guess my question is, well, is it actually more complex, or is it just the same with all the other type of assets that you've you know you've hinted at that uh, that your department looks after. It, it certainly is complex. Uh, the, the, the interesting part of a, of a facility condition assessment, as, as we bring in somebody to do the inspection, we wouldn't want to set them free and on their own. We certainly want to have some oversight. And uh, so uh, although we do have our, our badging and, and our CIDA uh, restrictions uh, at an airport, uh, I, I think it's key to, to stay in, in close contact with what it is that they're seeing, what are they documenting so that we later understand uh, what those conditions are. And perhaps a follow on to that, are the sort of things that are on an airport, again, you know, I could imagine they're, they're specialized and unique and different, but actually maybe every facility is, is equally different. So all the unique things we have on an airport, yes, are unique, but, but so might every other kind of place have their own unique things. It's, is that is that something that makes a difference or, or is the uniqueness of everywhere really just the same? <laughs> you know, they say you've, when you've seen one airport, you've seen one airport. So all, all airports are certainly different and, and unique amongst themselves. I, I think what's unique about our, our, our systems or building systems, uh, there are a few assets, you know, passenger boarding bridges, uh, baggage handling systems. Uh, th those are certainly unique. But when you look at uh, the overall building and facility, the roofs, chiller plants, electrical, mm -hmm. plumbing, uh, any other mechanical items, all of those are very similar to any other large building that you would normally maintain. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, uh, Gabriel. Um, again, if people have questions, please do uh, use use the chat and uh, we'll pick those up with the, with the subsequent presentation. So we move on to the second speaker. Uh, I'll introduce uh, Robert Fitzjohn. Uh, Rob has worked at Heathrow for 19 years, in various roles in engineering, information management and technology, including working on the construction of Terminal 2 and Terminal 5, and most recently the airport's expansion project. He's the special data lead, spatial data lead, and Rob's currently setting the GIS geospatial strategy and standards post-COVID and implementing the airport's new Esri Arc GIS solution. So, Rob, uh, the digitization of asset inspection and maintenance procedures. Over to you. Hi, Ian, and uh, and uh, yeah, thanks for that. So, hi, I'm Rob, spatial lead for Heathrow Airport, and today I'm going to talk to you about two recent projects at Heathrow. Firstly, our asset inspection replacement project, which will be live in the operation at the end of this month, and like secondly, the insourcing of our habitat management act activities last summer. So let's move to the next slide. Uh, so first, a, a little history on airfield inspections. On the back of a CAA audit, Heathrow was required to meet a new set of requirements to uh, uh, provide a robust auditable process for managing the operational status of airside assets whilst making available evidence of inspections completed. To meet this expectation and replace the 
original unconnected error prone processes, airside operations in 2016 implemented the Airfield Asset Inspection and Maintenance Tool, also known as AIM. AIM was a customized application integrated with our Heathrow Map Live mapping solution and our IBM Maximo solution as well to log faults and monitor the operation and maintenance of assets across the air across the, the, uh, the airfield. The tool provided a reduction in time to complete inspections, increased accuracy of uh, fault reporting, increased quality of information with the ability to include supporting photos, audibility and traceability improvements of opened and closed faults through Maximo, uh, variable inspection levels easier to perform, maintenance uh, providers provided with improved business information, optimization of civil team uh, work plans and improved colleague satisfaction. The AIM solution was, however, a platform created from scratch, which incurred uh, great cost to Heathrow for both its operation and enhancements. The solution was implemented on a specific technology stack that was that uh, very soon became obsolete, making the platform sorry meaning the platform had limited functionality and was overly complicated to operate, maintain, configure, and enhance. And for these reasons, the uh, solution could it, it couldn't keep pace with the needs and wants of the operation. The excellent news, though, was that following a successful procurement process, the Esri Arc GIS Enterprise uh, platform was uh, like selected, and um, Esri being the market leader in uh, like spatial software, would replace all components of Heathrow's existing mapping solutions, including the components of the AIM tool and Heathrow Map Live. The Esri Heath Map Live replacement project was all set for completion in the summer of 2020, but like most projects at Heathrow, were placed on pause because of COVID. Okay, if I just go to the next slide. Um, so, unlike other components of the Heathrow Map Live replacement project, which would include the mapping of like, such maps as winter resilience, aircraft ground movements, and the airport's underground like. like uh, services, the airside operations aim replacement solution had its funding uh, approved at the um, at the start of 2021, and the and it's all set for completion at the end of this month. Uh, the uh, it will be called Alfred, and it will and it will provide the operation with a flexible solution sitting on evergreen out of the box tech a. Solution easier to use with improved hardware, with iPads replacing clunky uh, Panasonic uh, uh, iPad AL equivalents, easier to use iOS applications for uh, fault logging and reporting. Um, accuracy is now up to 20 centimeters with the new Trimble units. The uh, uh, solution includes new offline. Uh, Build modes for always on information capture. Uh, it, um, it, the existing inspection processes uh, were improved. Live map updates automated through Heath Map Live, enhanced reporting, visualizations, and analysis. And uh, for finally, the number of assets uh, reported on was increased. Um, I'll just go to the next one. Um, so as well as the iPad application, the team created a user-friendly web view that can be viewed on a how computer at home or in the office, which you, which you should be able to see on your screen with a, with a sample set of reported faults and inspections. Um, if I just open the link. So that's here. So the Alfred web view enables the user to visualize various maps and metrics that airside operations and engineering can use to manage the status of the airfield. So if I just show you a couple of these now, so we have the operational map here, which if I just zoom out, which is the overview of, of all collected airfield assets. Um, and then you can filter through to individual maps so oops, sorry my internet's just catching up if i go to home here we've got all the inspections 
And if I just wait for some of those to come up, they should be black little circles. Uh, come on. Okay, it's just coming. Um, okay, I'll move on. Here we've got the status of the uh, blocks. So that's basically, okay, it's frozen. Okay, let me just restart it. Sorry about this. Um, so at the bottom you've got the individual maps so as i said this is the operational map which is the overview of all collected airfield faults and inspections the inspection map uh, shows um, all inspections completed and just waiting for it to come through come on uh, Okay, I'll move on. But what you should have is um, all, all the inspections completed come up on the screen. Oh, here we go, finally. So if, if you click on one, one of these, it will I say what inspection was completed. You can kind of cycle through and it will tell you the different inspections that have occurred. Um, here is the, if I just come out of that. Oh, I think it's, oh, there we go. Here's the block status. So this is the, um, status of all the blocks on the airfield if they're opened or closed. So if I just go here and show you the key, you can see if it's long-term, if it's short-term, if it's urgent block closure, for example. Um, this one here, this, uh, this map here visualizes the faulty assets and surface faults. So if I just show you, if you click on uh, this little item here, this will tell me that there's that there was a lead on an AGL, there was a single outage. And if I click on one of the this item up here, this will tell me this is a hard surface uh, fault. And then if I come over here to the FOD um, and select on one of the FOD items, um, this will visualize. So this sh um, sh I shows you all the FOD that has been located and uh, recovered on the airfield. So if I just click one of these, um, it will show you that some litter has been found and there should be a photo. If I click on another one, okay, these are just tests. This is a test information. Let's just go to another one. Uh, come over here. So this one is saying that there was some wood found. There's a photo of some wood. Um, and then up on the left-hand side here, this is a list of all of the inspections and the faults. Uh, so if I just cycle through to FOD because we've got the FOD map on the screen. If I click on one of these items, it will show me where the FOD item is. You can keep on just cycling through. Uh, just let my internet catch up, sorry about that. Um, and then up here on the top, you have information about the inspections. This is saying that we've got 17 inspections in progress, but they aren't complete yet. Um, here's some information about uh, the actual faults. This is saying uh, that we've got some um, faults uh, uh, to do with the AGR lights. These are open faults on the runways and these are on the approach. Here we have some service requests. These are P1, P2s, P3s, P4s. Here's some information on the blocks, what's open, what's closed. And then up here, you can like, filter on the shift. And then over here, you can like, filter on the history. So uh, when you actually want to actually I see the information is it for the last month is it for the last week etc so that's all on the alfred um tool if there are any questions please let me know at the end uh, so if i just now go back to the presentation and go back to full screen and go to the next page um okay so next up is habitat management as part of our safety management system Heathrow has to show that it can effectively manage its habitats to a, in accordance with CAP 772 for, to fulfill aerodrome license requirements. This includes a light, this includes the maintenance of a long grass policy. And at Heathrow, this equates to two and a half million square meters or 399 football pitches. And all of these require cutting, fertilizing and weed treatments. Okay, so if I go to Next slide. So as part of the airport's wide efficiency uh, 
savings exercise and with the five-year habitat management contract up for renewal in in the summer of 2021 the airport started to look at alternative options at a cost of 950k per year for an outsource service which would often exceed the um like contract a proposal to insource the habitat management activity was identified estimated an investment of 150k would uh, would be required to uh, purchase the required equipment to insource the service without increasing resource levels after final investment for training qualifications equipment and consumables a cost saving of around 750k against the outsourced five-year contract could be achieved whilst improving my flexibility and accountability for the operation with the overwhelming um, my positives of insourcing the habitat management activities a, a project was an initiated in early 2021 and uh, by the uh, summer had successfully insourced the activity with the airport's airside operations team. Whilst insourcing the activity, there was also an opportunity to review the current standards, processes and procedures to enhance the relationship between habitat conditions, wildlife activities and the impacts on aerodrome safety. Um, okay, next slide. So one of these enhancements was a proof of concept to improve how airside operations manage the status of the airport's uh, grass cutting processes, which unlike a lot of our other operational processes that had been automated or enhanced through tech still relied on manual time consuming activities. The first phase in involved one of the transportation officers collecting the status of the uh, grass length and the type of cut it had had via pen and paper. For example, the uh, grass is under 200 mil and has had a small tract cut. Phase two uh, required the officer to transfer the paper notes into a uh, SharePoint for auditing purposes. And finally, phase like uh, three, the uh, status of each of, uh, of each grass area had to be drawn onto a printed um, version of an airfield map by hand. So this was a very slow, clunky process. It was estimated that these three phases of status collection took approximately eight and a half hours a week to complete, which if you multiply that by six weeks to cut all the grass areas, which in 2021 happened eight uh, times, that equated to well over 400 hours to collect and manage the information alone. Not only is this a huge resource drain, but after speaking with the operation, it was clear that the current um, uh, process was unreliable and information is often lost or inputted incorrectly when being added into SharePoint or onto the paper map. So after a, a bit of investigation with the airside team, I created a mobile application using the existing out-of-the-box entry tools from the Alfred project. It was important to I use out of the box tools as I wanted to understand how quickly something could be stood up without timely customizations. I'm going to run a quick video of the application to show how easy it is to like alter the status um, out on the airfield using the iPad application. So I'll just play this video and run some commentary at the same time. Uh, okay, so here you can see a like map of Heathrow's airfield. I can then pull up a key where you can see the grass areas kind of by length and the type of grass cutting activity that has taken place. For example, small tractor cut. I can then zoom into the location of interest. If I wasn't at home and on the airfield, my location would be visualised automatically. If I select the grass area, the attributes are pulled up on the, the left hand side and they will show the status of the grass area chosen. You can then edit the, uh, the status of the grass area attributes by clicking the pencil. Um, to edit you, I simply click the required field and either and enter either a, a pre-populated option, uh, for example, grass length, or you can add some free text for additional information. You can then add a, a grass cutting activity type by clicking on the blue plus. And if I was out on the field, it would also take me to my location. In this example, I, I select the um, like type of cut it's had and the uh, grass area and the appropriate symbol is placed on the grass area, as you can see on the screen. All edits are live and can be seen by all users with the required access, either on the iPads as seen here or at home or in the office via a web link where extra metrics on the airfields um, on uh, the airfield can be viewed similar to Alfred. 
Uh, okay, so if I just go to the next screen. Um, so in a small trial last year to test the use of the mobile application, it is estimated that the weekly status collection activity had been reduced to five hours, which over the course of the year equates to a resource saving pot potential of under four weeks, of, of a little under four weeks. This is a great news for the operation and along with getting the application up, lifted from proof of concept to be operational, ready and supported by I IT, we are also looking at enhancing the application's interface, reporting, metrics and an analysis opportunities for airside operations to take advantage of. So that's me, happy to answer any questions on the presentation so far. Okay, thank you, Rob. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, one, one question about the the first part, the Alfred um, system. So I can I can imagine that kind of data can be you know, shared with the ops team who might do the inspections, the engineers, any contractors that might do some of the remedial works. But are there also any plans to share it more widely, maybe with you know a ATC or with any of the airlines or the handlers? You know, I'm sure there'd be a lot of interest in the status of some of these things. Yeah, definitely. This is kind of like um, the our platform. We, so the Esri platform is coming into play now. So the uh, first part comes into play at the end of this month, and then our Heathrow Map Live re uh, uh, replacement of all of our tools that comes in to, into operation at the end of this year. All going well. So, and what we are looking to uh, do is to have this information available to any user that needs it, but they would have to have those access rights. It would all have to be approved. But then what we're looking to also do is to combine this information with other information. So for example, you could add kind of weather information to this. So you could like, uh, if it was if if it was gonna rain or it was gonna snow or uh, whatever the case may be, you um, wouldn't have, have the, um, the guys out in the field like cutting the grass when it was wet. You would like plan it when it was dry and all of that kind of stuff. So um, there's, I think with the kind of power of these kind of tools is the, is the kind of more information that you have, the uh, more questions you can ask of it. So it's mm. just getting as much information as you can. It's really important to get that single source of the truth, um, which this platform is like trying to achieve because we're going to have everything kind of either link into it or, um, or, or kind of like this will be where our spatial information is held. Um, so that's probably, I'm hoping that answers your question. Yeah, no, it does. No, no that's, that's very good. Um, I suppose there's another layer of that going back to the theme of the conference. You know, is there is there a wildlife behavior, wildlife data could be added into the tool as well? It, it, there's yeah, lots of yeah, ideas yeah. here, but, you know, it, it's their way it could be used for more operational information as well. Totally. So we have got a wildlife a power app um, mm -hmm. at the airport at the, the moment, which is really good. Um, but um, there's things that this tool can offer so you could take those kind of sightings of of the uh of wildlife be it um some birds or a lot of fox for example and then we can like look at the um like correlation of um why are those repeated incidents happening you can start to look at other kind of like sources of information to kind of understand why is that happening is um types of wildlife is uh, is it attracting other types of wildlife and there's different things there you can like start to look at so we um, definitely want to open this up to the, the kind of wider audience um because mm -hmm. the uh, more people who have access to this kind of information as i said the more questions you can ask of it you can like, solve those yes. problems yes. um and all of that kind of stuff yes uh, that's great rob I, I i sense your enthusiasm and, and i can see that there's there's almost a, you know your, your imagination is the limit you know it can do lots of lots of things so so that's really good thank thank you rob that's that's very interesting um we move on a reminder about questions in in the chat um but we move on to the next speaker i'll introduce johan lindvall uh, Johan has 25 years experience as a commercial pilot, as a captain on 737s with SAS, and he has a PhD in psychology from the University of Gothenburg. He's currently a consultant within the safety management, safety culture, resilience, engineering and human factors uh, in Swedavia in various domains uh, and also works in railways, healthcare and nuclear power. So Johan's talk is aeronautical decision making in context 
the influence of effect and experience on procedural violations. Over to you, Johan. Uh, well, thank you very much for the introduction. And um, I'm actually working as a safety manager at the moment and at uh, uh, Sverovi Airports, and we run uh, about 10 airports in uh, Sweden. And the title of my speech today is actually the same as the title of my dissertation. So that's what I'm going to, to talk about. And as a safety manager, I'm responsible for the safety management system at the airports and also uh, responsible for uh, developing the safety culture within the organization. Uh, the dissertation is actually from 2011, but I still think that the um, results are still valid. And the picture on the right side shows a model of decision making that I used in my uh, in my uh, dis uh, dissertation. Um, I'm not going to talk about all these parts because they would take about two hours. So I'm going to cherry pick and uh, show and take uh, talk about why we sometimes uh, violate uh, working procedures. Um, in my dissertation, I was focusing on pilot's decision making and why we sometimes uh, decide to. Uh, uh, violate procedures, but it's also applicable in any domain, really, where uh, we have work procedures, like on, on the air side of airfields, for example, or aerodromes. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, reasons for violating procedures and not following them uh, on a general perspective from the literature uh, in general. I'm going to talk a little bit about my dissertation or results from that, and maybe the most interesting, some practical implications of it in the, in the end. So, try to get the, to the next picture. So, these are reasons uh, for um, violating uh, uh, procedures. Let's see if I get... Uh... Oh, there we go. Good. Uh, so, there are many reasons for it. Uh, I'll show some of them here. This could be a manifestation of lack of organizational safety culture. Like, safety cultures is... Uh, build up of several parts, really. It's uh, uh, the SNS safety management system, the uh, uh, routines that we have, the working procedures, all the documentation we have, uh, how we're supposed to work. But it's not really enough. We need also an understanding of why we should behave in the way we do and why we should work, follow the work procedures. And we should also be able to behave in that way. And all these things have to work together and it must be a function of safety culture. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, and then it could also be conflict between management and uh, staff. Uh, it could be the other way around as well. So if there is a conflict between management and staff, they say, well, we follow the procedures and then we can't really work in that way because the work procedures are not really adjusted to, to real life, our work is really done. It could also be poor morale, poor supervision and checking. Uh, not following up, not to getting support in the work and the decision making. Group norms, conditioning violations. The norms and values in the organizations are very important. What is okay to do? Is it okay to take shortcuts or is it not? That affects our behavior a lot. Misperception of hazards, which I, I, I tend to underestimate uh, risk in certain uh, uh, sometimes, and I'm going to talk about that a bit later. And there's also a perceived lack of management care <clears throat> and concern, excuse me. It means that you might think that if the management don't care, why should I care? Okay. Okay, I turn to the next page. I'm not quite sure how we change to the next place. Right, now you see it, now I got it. There's also a uh, little enthusiasm and not pride in work. There's also much culture. And um, uh, being a tough guy. It can, it's also believed that the bad outcomes will not happen. I've done this many times before, you might think, and it might nothing will happen again. Uh, low self-esteem, learned helplessness, 
there are terms that means that so it doesn't matter what I do, I get um, I get uh, a bad feedback anyway. Even if I follow the procedures or if I don't follow the procedures, I, don't, I get a negative uh, feedback on it. It's also a perceived license to bend rules, which means that sometimes the management actually wants me to bend rules. They want to, to get in order to get a job done. It could also be that the rules are not very good and, and the procedures are not very good. They're not optimized for how work is really done. They're just written for, to be a, a backup for, for the management. So when it comes to my dissertation, then it means um, I was looking into why uh, a particular situation uh, when it comes to pilots uh, we have something called a stabilized approach, which means that uh, from about 1,000 feet um, downwards on the approach glide path, then it should be stabilized. I mean, certain criteria should be uh, fulfilled. The gear should be down, landing flaps should be set, landing checklist should be completely done. So speed and, and height should be within certain limits. Otherwise, you have to perform a missed approach and abort the, the, uh, the landing. So you have a choice here, either you continue or you don't continue and perform a missed approach then. Uh, and we talked about uh, risk perception and uh, estimation of risk before. I used some theories in, in this uh, in the dissertation as a basis. And one is the prospect fear by Daniel Kahneman and, and Amos Tversky. They actually got the Nobel Prize for this uh, theory uh, in, in economics. So what it basically says is that uh, we are actually quite bad at, at uh, estimating uh, probabilities as humans. And what it shows here, this curve shows that we are normally uh, overestimating small probabilities. That's an explanation to why we sometimes um, buy insurances or we buy lottery tickets, because we overestimated the small probability of actually uh, failing or succeeding. But some critics say that this is only valid if you, like in these examples, um, uh, that you're sitting down with a pen and paper in a laboratory and asking questions with no consequences. But when you make decisions in real life, it's more complicated than that. Then you start instead of, instead of uh, overestimating risk, we uh, instead, instead tend to underestimate risks. And this is what I used in my dissertation as well, this theory. Uh, I also looked at non-technical skills, which is a tool that is used to assess pilots or crews, flight crews in, in simulators and other um, situations. We look at how good people are, cooperation, leadership, the management skills, situation awareness, and decision-making. And I was looking particularly on the decision making uh, uh, part of it, which is about how much you involve your colleague in, in the decision making, how much you talk about the risks, how supportive you are to each other and so on. I also looked if there are any personality differences in terms of general, general decision making styles, where you can be either more rational and um, or you can be intuitive, dependent, avoidant or spontaneous. Rational, then you seek info and review options. Intuitive, then you trust emotions. Dependent, then you seek advice a lot. And uh, avoidant, you procrastinate and don't take any initiative for decision making. Spontaneous, yes, you want to make decisions as fast as possible and just want to have it done. So, with my dissertation here, um, I used a scenario based. Uh, study people were put in a situation where they had to where they were unstabilized and had to make a decision i used self-evaluation scales and notics and, and general decision making styles i used quite experienced pilots for this uh, I, there was also asked other questions uh, concerning reasons for not following procedure or following the procedure so the results were like this. So the majority they actually choose to not follow the procedure, even if they're unstabilized, to continue the approach. And um, it's quite interesting that even if they knew the right answer on the question, they still were kind of honest and said, well, 
if I was in this situation, I would actually uh, continue the approach and, and violate the procedure. So why this is happening then? Well, um, I compared uh, those who decided to violate the procedure compared to those who complied to the procedure. So the violators, if I call them that, they were less uh, stressed, they feel more land-minded, they had made up their mind and said, oh, I'm, I'm decided to land, so they would say land-minded. They feel a pressure to land, it could be uh, corporate pressure, of being on time, punctuality is a lot of pressure on it. And uh, the rest is about um, uh, the no-tech skills, so they experience less support from colleagues for making decisions, or less prone to involve the colleagues for making decisions, and talk less about risk uh, with, uh, with the colleague. And also those who decide to violate, they consider the rule too strict, and uh, consider the rule being uh, less important for flight safety. They still think it's important, but there was a difference between compliance and violators, that the violators thought it was less important. They're also more overconfident in their own decision-making skills and have a more spontaneous and less rational decision-making style. And the majority states that they use the experience for making judgments and decision-making. And we talked about, I talked about risk perception before. So what this picture shows is that here we have uh, those who decide to violate the procedure. They uh, state that uh, there is no difference between uh, the risk for an incident if you continue in, into land or making a, um, an approach. Compared to the compliance who decided to uh, make an uh, aborted takeoff, they uh, estimate the risk of an incident or a wrong excursion if they continue in, in, the, uh, in spite of being uh, unstabilized to be much higher than it is compared to making a go around and also compared to to violators. So there is a, we can say that compared to the compliance, the violators underestimate the risk for an incident, for example, in RAM excursions, if they continue into to land, even if they're unstabilized. So finally, I'll wrap up this is with some practical implications for um, uh, organization senior management. So lead by example is very important and develop a positive safety and just culture which is very important as well not only the documentation but also motivating and uh, make sure people understand why it's important uh, show commitment to to safety and also to why it's important to follow the procedures work with norms and values uh, as i said before it's very important uh, develop user-friendly instructions because instructions it could be instructions that are quite bad and it's not possible to work with them Communicate the purpose of the instructions, so that's the way to create the understanding. And provide necessary resources, of course, because one of the reasons why for people don't follow procedures is they, they have too much to do. They have to take shortcuts to be able to perform the work. And then finally also some practical implications for leaders and co-workers. <clears throat> it's about the same actually, it's about lead by example there as well. Acknowledge the importance of following procedures and show commitment. Follow up on behavior, give constructive feedback, and call attention to undesired behavior. Uh, That's a way to create better norms, what is okay and not okay in this working environment. <clears throat> Support the co workers in decision making. Be aware of your own other prerequisites and limitations as well when it comes, for example, estimating risks. Be assertive and voice concerns about deficient procedures is the final recommendation or practical implication. And uh, that actually uh, wraps up my presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Johan. Um, yeah, that's, that's very interesting. Uh, there, there's a, one, one particular question uh, uh, stands out, I think, that you know, in your in your study, you used experienced pilots uh, for your uh, analysis of the missed approach. Airports and and the aviation industry since COVID have perhaps lost some experience. You know, it's probably a less experienced uh, industry than it than it was two years ago. Uh, I wonder what you think the effects are of that lower experience would be on the results. 
Well, my experience from being away from from piloting for a while, I had, had the breaks for <coughs> also working as a pilot for seven years from one period. And uh, I was surprised how fast I came back into the business afterwards. So I was doing it for like a few simulator sessions and I felt like I, was, I hadn't been away. It's like being on, on a bike or something. Uh, you feel rusty in the beginning, but it, you quite fast come back to it. Perhaps the point was was uh, could could be rephrased slightly that we, with younger, less experienced people in the industry, the right. the the results out of any decision making are likely to be more variable than if you only worked with experienced people. I, I guess. Well, that's my guess. Would would you agree? Um, yes, both both yes and no. I would say that. Um... Experienced pilots, they normally or experienced, I've seen the same in the nuclear power industry, experienced people, workforce, they are not so reliable on the instructions in the same way as young and inexperienced uh, mm -hmm. workers are. Mm -hmm. So it depends on what level of the of the uh, level of detail in the instructions that you want to need, uh, want to use. So maybe um, a workforce that which is not so experienced, they need more detail and uh, more experienced um, pilots and other work, uh, working force, they don't need so much detail. They're more, they need more a frame to stay, stay within yeah. this frame and you'll be okay. Okay, yeah, no, that's a, a very interesting point. Okay, thank you, Johan. Um, I think that's uh, the end of the presentations uh, for this session. So thank you to Gabriel Navarez, uh, Robert Fitzjohn and Johan Lindvall. Uh, I'll thank the series sponsor, Robin Radar for this. Um, we're now taking a short break as we'll be uh, back with the next session in about 20 minutes at, on the half hour, uh, where we'll be talking a bit more about birds and habitat management with some speakers about wildlife. So uh, hope you've all enjoyed it. Thank you very much uh, and goodbye. Robin Radar Systems provide you with a complete overview of bird and drone activity on and around your aerodrome. Our bird radars provide you with the actionable information you need to take control of your bird hazard issue. With both tactical and strategic data on offer, you'll be able to mitigate and prevent high-risk bird activity more accurately and with less effort than before. Increase safety while reducing bird strike incidents and expensive claims. Our drone detection systems enable you to take early control of drone hazards as they develop. Coordinate drone incidents with confidence and share clear and accurate threat location information with law enforcement agencies and other stakeholders. Reduce costly disruption and delays while increasing safety and security. Subscription-based pricing options available. Get in touch with us to find out more.
The rising air traffic volumes over the last decades puts increasing demands on reliable aeronautical information availability, which is often inaccurate, outdated, inconsistent, faulty or hard to read, and so undermining the safety of civil aviation. NG Aviation supports the industry by the digitization of various aeronautical information, significantly increasing safety, improving data quality and enhancing situational awareness. Its digital platform transforms previously scattered aeronautical information into a single comprehensive data source shared among all aviation stakeholders. NG Aviation gives all involved parties the possibility to speak the common language. Our platform significantly improves communication, information and data exchange. So, for example, if a taxiway must be closed, all involved parties are notified via digital interface. Digital communication allows for clear, more effective and safer airport operations. Digital data improves communication and navigation through complex airspaces. In case of closure due to military exercise or unexpected circumstances, stakeholders are notified in order to avoid any hazardous situation. The unexpected closure of a runway during the approach is not a problem anymore. Our platform shares the information immediately in a clear and visually understandable way. NG Aviation builds safer and more effective digital aviation of the future. Join the revolution now. A powerful solution to the FOD problem, AFOD, is an electro-optical detection system supported with artificial intelligence, which is built to prevent the damage to airplanes and airports caused by foreign objects. Thoroughly inspecting airport runways, AFOD provides a constant flow of images and information to a central unit located at the control tower to be further processed by advanced AFOD algorithms. AFOD serves four main functions. By continuously inspecting airport runways, it detects FOD specifying their location, size, number, and type of material. It also identifies wildlife presence, providing information as detailed as the species of the animal detected. It detects cracks and accumulation areas. It measures the depth of snow and thickness of ice. At Moog, we understand how costly foreign object debris can be, which is why we offer the Tarsier Automatic Runway FOD Detection System. In the 11 years since Tarsier was created, it has helped ensure 6 million plus FOD-free operations. It's the United States military's system of choice for FOD detection, and it can function in any and all weather conditions. The difference between Tarsier and manual FOD inspections is easy to see. Tarsier has proven that it detects all the FOD all the time, while manual inspections may miss items due to lighting conditions or the speed of a vehicle inspection. For over 65 years, Moog has been servicing the aircraft industry with innovative products and solutions. With the Tarsier Runway FOD detection system, we're providing a solution that can generate revenue for your airport, prevent costly airport damage and lawsuits, and improve safety. Contact us.